for us to be host, for us to be host, hosting Professor Shauna Stoddard from um, Rhodes College in in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Shauna is a, um, a PhD in chemistry and biochemistry from the University of Mississippi. She's also received a master's in education from the Freed Hardeman uh, University. Her prior, previous training was in um, chemistry in the biomedical science track at Prairie View A and M uh, University. She's presently, as I said, an associate professor, having earned early tenure at Rhodes College, and she's also director of the STEM cohort mentoring program there, and has made you know considerable strides both in uh, research, as you'll hear, and also in mentoring undergraduates to the point where they can um, uh, succeed uh, in uh, doing original research in the context of a, of a primarily undergraduate university. So um, Shana, it's great to have you here. Thank you very much for coming to visit and we, uh, we look forward to your seminar. Thank you for that introduction. So thank you for coming out. I'm excited to be here and talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing both in my lab, but also in the classroom. And I will be taking some strategic strides so that you get to see the integration of how we do both uh, at this work, the school that I'm at. So my lab is the Molecular Immunotherapeutics Research Lab, or MIR lab, not mirror MIR, we say MIR. And we have really three different approaches or three different pr projects that we kind of focus on. And first is our small molecule drug design project. And this is where we do a lot of work with our histone deacetylases and proteins that have active sites where we want to bind small ligands to. And so I will talk a little bit about our coronavirus project, which falls under this branch. I won't be talking about the HDAC stuff today, although that is an exciting project and we have some great things that are going there. We also have the protein engineering side where we are designing both potential biotherapeutics and also bio tools that might help us to understand the structure function of proteins and potentially work with autoimmune disease therapies as well. And then the last project or area that we work in is structural biology. And so I'm very interested in what the structure of proteins look like. I think that making great images of proteins is not only essential, but it is also a helpful way for us to understand their function. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll leap into, let me make sure. Okay, there we go. All right, so I'll, I'll leap into those projects going in the reverse direction. We'll do the structural biology type work first, looking at the computational part, and then we'll move towards the uh, small molecule design. So molecular recognition, if I could sum up my lab and what I do, it is really molecular recognition. We try to figure out how things bind and interact with each other. And as we do that, can we create guidelines, optimization toolkits, anything that will help us to describe selective interactions or broad spectrum type interactions that allow us to target a range of biomolecules. And so in using those, those give us the keys to design, our tools for bio tools and therapeutics. Let's see if I can just move this up here. So in the first project that we're gonna cover is focused on our autoimmune disease. And in this one, we're both looking at the therapeutic design for autoimmune disorder treatment, but then we've also leapt this into thinking about bio tools that help us to understand the function of a particular protein of interest. So autoimmune diseases are extremely prevalent. They are the second leading cause of long-term chronic illness. And so the challenge with it is people have them for a very long time. And sometimes it takes about 10 years for people to actually get diagnosed with the correct autoimmune disorder. And then they live for a very long time, but the quality of life is much different. And so you don't, it's your immune system is constantly suppressed because that's kind of the way we treat it throw everything at it and we kind of hope that something will work. We know that in America, about 23.5 million Americans suffer from at least one autoimmune disease. And typically we do see that people have one and then maybe two. There are about 80 to 100 diseases that have been identified to actually be autoimmune diseases. And in my lab, we have two primary focuses at the current moment. One is primary membranous nephropathy. And this is an organ specific autoimmune disease that's in the kidney. And then also systemic lupus erythematosus. And we're in, uh, interested in that one because it's systemic and we wanna see one, can we apply the same rules to the organ specific autoimmune disorders as we can to the systemic autoimmune disorders. And something also that has a broad range 
of targets and antigens. And so SLE definitely fits that bin. So when we look at this PMN or primary membranous nephropathy, about 10 to 12 million individuals worldwide have this organ specific disorder and about 10 to 20% of those individuals will end up in end stage renal disease. And so the kidney will start to become attacked. The way this occurs is you have the basal lining of the kidney membrane right here. And on this, the membrane, we have the foot cells of these podocytes in green. These podocytes will express two antigens, which we know of now, and there's at least one more. But they will express these antigens, and unfortunately, the immune system starts to say, hey, that's not self. I need to destroy that tissue, and it starts to inflame those podocytes. Those podocytes begin to swell, immune posits begin to be deposited, and we get these complex that build up. And the challenge with that is we start to no longer be able to filter the urine. And so we start to see proteinuria and the nephrotic syndrome develop within these patients. And so right now, this disease is not curable. We can, in some cases, get to a stage where people are stable, but we don't necessarily have a way to stop or prevent the disease from continuing to occur. And so this is a primary focus in, in my particular research, in part because I have family members with this disorder. So some approaches that we have right now to treat autoimmune disease is that we can develop specific peptides. So if we consider this is the how autoimmune diseases occur, I have an autoantibody self-reactive. It begins to target a self-antigen, which is something that we normally express, which is not problematic. And all of a sudden the body says that's not self. And so it now begins to elicit or act the immune system to target that particular antigen. One way that people have approached this is by developing a blocking peptide to essentially compete with the antigen in and of itself. And that makes great sense. The idea of this is that we would have something that is modulating the immune system. That is what we typically do is modulate the immune system, but also that it's antigen specific. Another approach that we are using or that we attempt to use is by using the dendritic cells and by taking those and giving people low doses of basically the self peptide and hoping that we can induce some sort of a state where the body no longer recognizes that as a problem. So similar to the way allergy, allergy shots work, where we take allergy shots and then over time, we become sensitized to that and we don't we desensitize to that and we no longer seem to have an over response to it. And so in this case, the challenge we have is there's low success translates, translating that to the clinic. We can cure autoimmune disease in mice. We have very uh, significant difficulty doing that in people. And one challenge is the way mice Mice's immune system work compared to the way ours work. There are some different strategies and or different pathways that they'll use. Additionally, when we look at the way the allergy shots work compared to the way autoimmune diseases are created, they're not eliciting the same parts of the immune system. And so in my lab, we've decided to take a different approach. Instead of trying to modulate the immune system, our idea is can we hide the antigen? And so what we want to do is try to create if we have an antigen here, a cap, a blocking cap that sits over the antigen or sits over the region that is being recognized by the immune system. And in doing so, hopefully it would, the hypothesis is that it would treat it similar to an infection. When the antigen is no longer present, the immune system titers begin to drop down because there's no longer a need to produce those self or those reactive antibodies. And so the idea is, can this approach work as well for an autoimmune disease. And so we're trying to pioneer this and hopefully we'll have some great success. So what does that mean? We have this approach, this novel approach where we have an antigen here, but there's also a specific site. Proteins don't typically, the immune system isn't typically targeting the whole protein. It's targeting a few residues on that. And we call that the epitope site. That epitope site, we wanna essentially cover up with some small molecule, whether that's a macromolecule, whether that's a biomolecule, we want to try and hide it with something. And the way we want to do it is through just basic biochemistry principles, molecular interactions. Can we get what we design to recognize that spike site tightly enough that it can cover it up long enough with the kinetics that the immune system doesn't really have time to approach it? So what antigens are involved in PMN? There's two that have been discovered. The first is the phospholipase A2 receptor. And we know that about 70% of patients actually elicit a response to this particular antigen. And so this is the dominant one that we see. Uh, this one was discovered by my collaborator Beck et al. Uh, and they have found this one to have three, we found so far three sites that are targeted. So this particular protein is a membrane protein, transmembrane protein, 
And the cysteine-rich domain, or we call the cis-R domain, there's a fibronectin domain and then the C-type lectin domains. We know that the cysteine-rich domain and then C-type lectin domain one and C-type lectin domain seven are the ones where we know at least to have three epitopes to that are present. Now, it could be that there's epitope spreading, which is what we believe, but those right now are currently the three epitope sites that we know of. Now, in this particular uh, disease, we also found a second antigen, the thrombospondin type 1 containing domain 7A. And this is where I'll spend a lot of the talk on. This is one of the proteins that I, I, I really enjoy working with. Now, this one, we have about 5 to 10% of the patients that respond to this one, which means we know that there's a third antigen out there. It's currently unresolved as to what that antigen is. So in this protein, before when I started these projects, neither of these had been crystallized. There was no structure or information that was available. And so for me, that's a challenge because I need to know a target as a chemist. I need to understand structure if I'm going to design something to bind to it. So since there were no experimentally solved structures when we started the work, we had to say, well, what do we do next? We're going to predict that structure. And so, and to predict these structures, these are huge proteins. These proteins are quite big. And so we'll just give you just a set. In the, uh, the PLLA2R, this is the ricin domain. It's another name for CISR. We predicted the model or predicted the structure of just the C type, the C cysteine rich domain, the CISR domain. And what we found is this globular type structure. We have predicted the structure of all the individual domains. I'm just going to highlight this one because we discovered one of the antigens that was uh, the epitope regions. So in pink, what you see colored, and in green, what you see colored, are two of the epitope sites that are located. Blue is just a linker between the two. What was nice is that experimentally, a group in France, Fresquet et al., they discovered or experimentally that these antigen, that this was the epitope site. And using our computational models, we were able to actually also predict that the same way. And so we predicted that these were the right ones that we should be targeting. And that gives us a site to attack. So this is just one of them. The second one is the thrombospondin type 1 containing domain 7A, which I will call THSD7A for the remainder of the talk. This protein is huge. It has 1,600 plus amino acids. It's 210 kilodaltons after it has post-translational modifications, which means it's big. And so when we think about this, there are four regions of this. There's a signal peptide up front, which we don't really need. To, it just kind of helps it to localize where it needs to go in the cell, the extracellular portion, the transmembrane portion, and the intracellular portion. It's this extracellular portion that's most important for the work that I do, because I need to see where the immune system could have access to targeting this particular protein. What you see here is this domain. And this was what was originally thought that the structure of this protein was. It was predicted to have 12 what we call thrombospondin type 1 repeat domains or TSRs. And we, we looked at this and my collaborator said, I don't think that it's 11. I don't think that it's 11. I actually think there's more. And so a TSR domain is a domain that was found in 2002 by Tan et al. And what they discovered is that it has a rippled strand, strand A, and then it folds into a beta strand, strand B, and then another beta strand, strand C. On that rippled strand, we have this feature where we have a WSX, WS. And what that is, is these tryptophans that stick into the center of the B strand. The B strand will have some positively charged residues, so arginines or lysines, and we create what is called a characteristic tryptophan ladder. And so there was the paper that they published what walks up the ladder because we see this uh, particular domain. So how many though? He said, I don't think it's 11. I actually think that it's 21 to 22 possibly. And so I got this picture from the Unipro database before they had updated it, uh, before they had changed it from the 11. So I got it when they had 15, it's no longer 15. We've now got it to at least 19, but we think there's there's 21. So he sends this, sends me this, this alignment. We say, okay, let's start looking at this and see, does that make sense? So we do alignment, blast the protein, and we start to kind of categorize and say, well, here are the characteristic six cysteines that we would find. And so we start matching these up what we see here is strand A, I think the mouse is. Uh, the mouse is, okay, so the mouse is kind of moving around. But strand A here at the bottom is where we find that rippled strand. Strand B is where you find the arginines and lysines and typically positively charged residues that intercalate in between those tryptophans. And then strand C is that back strand. 
And so we were able to identify that there are both uh, strand A's, which we call there's group one TSP or TSR domains, which are called thrombospondin type one like domains. And then a second group that matched to be what we call F spondin TSR domains. So class one versus class two TSRs are differentiated by the location of the cysteine residues. These cysteines create three disulfide bonds that hold those or tether those strands together. And based on the positioning of those, we can kind of identify which ones they best match. So we wanted to build this model out, but this is a multi-domain homology model, which is difficult to do. So usually if we're going to predict a computational structure, we've got a wonderful sequence. We put that sequence into some program, maybe FIRE2, and then from there we get a beautiful globular protein. And that's great. It works really well for small proteins. Well, this is our sequence. When we put this in as is, we get this. And we know that that was not correct. So that looks like junk. So what we had to do is figure out how will we actually make this model since there isn't anything out there that's capable of modeling a protein this large. And so this is where we came up with this idea, where I came up with this idea of let's, let's put it into pieces, right? We believe that we have these individual domains. Can we cut those down to what we think each of those individual domains are? Finding the beginning and the end of our particular domain structure. And then from there, we modeled or I modeled uh, two tandem repeats. So domain one and then domain two, it was called 8A and 8B for four. And then from there, check and see, let's make sure we have a really good model so that as we move forward to connect these pieces back together, we don't have to worry about trying to do a lot of extra minimizations later. So putting this puzzle together, I created about 21 of these segments. We did all the individual segments, but then I created overlapping sequences. And the purpose of that was to be able to do this. So in blue, we have, let's say, strand one and two, domain one and two, and in gold, we have strand two and three and then in purple strand three and four. If we take strand two from the blue and the gold and we overlap them, and I cut away one of them and link it back together, does that create our model? And so what we found is that, yes, we could do that, is that we could create these overlapping regions, realign them back, delete one of them, and connect the sequences back together. And that got us to this wonderful, beautiful model right here, which, uh, okay, so I how do I get out of the video? Are you trying to exit PowerPoint? No, I want to get the out the mouse out of the laser. Ah. Just deselect the laser footer. Ah, great. So we found that we had this huge protein and we were able to actually put this together to create this model that has 21 domains. And so each number is, indicates the individual domain that we find. Here's the sequence. And we published this back in 2018 for this particular protein. And so it was the, this multi-domain model of a protein that is ginormous, uh, but it actually was actually accurate where we were able to not only see that, no, there wasn't 11, but there was in fact 21. There is a 22nd domain. It starts off as a TSR, but then it kind of quickly devolves into something else. And then it goes into the, intra, the transmembrane protein and the intracellular membrane protein. So this was a great find for us to be able to find. There's in domain four, a polybasic region. And what we find that to be is this area where there's a high density of histidines, lysines, and arginines, and primarily lysine and arginine for THSD7A. And so we create this polybasic region, and this is where we began to predict that the potential function of this protein might be to bind something like heparin sulfate. So it's in the kidney, it's binding something very negatively charged in this region. In each of these domains, in one and two, these are the only two tandem domains that are uh, both group ones. After that, every other odd domain is a group 
two. So three F spawned in domain, five, seven, nine, 11, 13, all the way back are all what we call the class two TSRs. And so the even number domains after that are the group one TSRs, which was interesting to find that we have this sort of network of an AB, AB, AB repeating pattern, which we had not seen in another protein to have this many tandem repeats of one class that also alternated in this fashion. Another unique find was the insertions that we'll talk about a little bit later in the talk. So 1600 residues, we modeled 14 1,500 of them, 21 extracellular domains, and we got a model where 94% of the protein was in favored or allowed regions, only a few outliers, and when we looked at those, we were able to discover that they're forced into a particular conformation based on very stable residues around them. Now, this protein, we believe, is actually quite linear, and it lays itself out, and so the curvature of that is just part of the modeling, but that it is really a long linear protein. So now I want to use this, and we want to see, can we use this to predict where we need to be targeting? So we've got these epitope sites that we need to find, because that's what we want to cover up. With the epitope sites, we use the program Epitopia, and we put in the full three-dimensional model that we came up with, and it predicted the whole thing almost. It was like, wow, there's a lot on there. Does that make any sense? And so we had domains one all the way to 19, with the exception of domain 18 and four, our actually have, were predicted to have these epitopes. And domain four by ours were as well. These are just some of the students that were able to work on this project to help characterize some of these domains and figure out what were the commonalities between them and what were the characteristics of these individual epitope sites. Now, when we did this, we were like, wow, that's a lot. But it was actually experimentally corroborated. And so Seaford et al. did some work that same year that we were putting this together. And they uh, published this paper. And every domain that we had predicted, we caught through the, the model. And so that really actually gave us a lot of confidence that this model not only was really useful studying the structure and function of it, but that we could use this in a very nice predictive manner to uncover those. So if you read the Seaford paper and the Stoddard paper, the domain numbers are different because we named, numbered ours differently and they did theirs. So there's a, a, a way to kind of categorize them. So domains one and two, this is where 75% of the patients have auto on antibodies that target that particular domain. And that's what we found is really lit up. So everywhere you see a magenta or a pink sphere, that's a residue that was predicted to be an epitope site that could have some immunogenicity. So when you go back, we start to see what happens is epitope spreading. So it seems as if the immune system starts targeting the end of the protein and then begins to start finding more places that it wants to attack. And so we see that here. Uh, there are 21 domains and th that both the Seifert found and that we found ours are a little bit organized differently and ours seem to be the ones that um, the reviewers like, yeah, this is actually the correct 21 domains, but there were in fact both 21. So multi-domain modeling, we have a lot of uh, new modeling programs that are coming out, which are really great. And uh, there's been some wonderful work, especially with AI and, and the new models that we have. So we wanted to, when, when AlphaFold came out, I said, well, I want to see what AlphaFold would actually do with this. Like, how would it, it predict? And so what we found is that AlphaFold kind of made a globular protein. It did find these domains, but it kind of in, in, in made it Ball, all, ball the entire protein up. And so that was an interesting find. We were like, wow, that's, that's interesting. And so with the experimental work that has been done on this, we do know that this particular protein is very linear. So we see the THSD7A here in the green. Uh, and this work was done by Herwig et al. And then we also can see in the, uh, in the high resolution microscopy, in this case, the THSD7A is red. And so it's somewhere there in the, the slit diaphragm of the kidney. And so we now believe, or our hypothesis, is that it plays some role, particularly in, in filtering proteins itself. And that it's doing some sort of extracellular matrix reorganization that might be recruiting a network of proteins to elicit some sort of uh, response and filtration. So with this, we now have our protein. We understand what it looks like. We have epitope sites this time to design. So this is what the students really like to do uh, for a little while. And then they're like, okay, now I want to go to the lab and express it. So just in, in general, we'll look at both of them. And this is the process that we use. In this process, what we're doing is the students are engineering 
a, in this case, a monobody. And we pick the monobody scaffold because thinking downstream, what's going to be easy to express, what's going to be the cheapest that we can think about because that decreases cost to the patient on the back end. What is something that we can quickly get uh, that's high, finely tunable and that also has the option to tolerate a lot of mutations. And so the monobody scaffold seemed to fit really well. It worked very well for the PLA2R. And so what you see in purple are residues that the students identified, hey, if I change this, from a, 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 light, a, a tyrosine to a phenylalanine, I might elicit a new uh, interaction here. If I change this from a, a tyrosine to a tryptophan, I might increase the strength of a pi pi stacking interaction. Or here, if I change this from an asparagine to a aspartate, then I might create an electrostatic interaction. So they get finely tuned in being able to optimize or basically rationally design particular molecular recognition regions. And so we train them in that, and this is the students up here, this is Maggie, who's working on some of those, it was really fun. We then use, and we started with Rosie, and then we moved to HDOC. What we do is we're just ranking them, right? So we want lower negative scores. So the more negative it is, the better or more attracted it is to that particular protein. But because we're gonna take all of this to the lab, we're not looking for KD values, we're just kind of looking to see, are we moving in the right direction? We also did this for THSD7A, and so with THSD7A, here's just another example where the students said, there's a serine there, let's make that an aspartate so we can interact with this arginine. And so they learn all the interactions, they learn how to do these manipulations, and they design these themselves, and then they strategically work to increase binding affinity. So taking that to the lab has been really fun. Uh, and so the students that we've produced now a, a large library of what would be synthetic binding proteins that we have designed to target individual domains. So here is the PLA2R. What you're seeing in this table is the synthetic binding protein. This is just the name that we gave it. We have some sort of domain of interest. So THSD7A, domain one, TSR1. So that would be this individual domain down here. THSD7A, domain nine would be this ninth domain down here. And then PLA2Rs, the CISR domain would be this blue domain here. And then the C-type lectin seven would be this domain here. And so the idea is that if we made it or engineered it to bind to domain one, that it should bind to domain one selectively because I do like selectivity. And so we see that with the three UIO, the student design one where we do an ELISA assay, kind of see what, what does it bind to? What's its binding profile? And so for this one, one that was designed to TSR1, it binds to TSR1. We see no binding to any of the other domains in the protein that were tested or to the other protein as well. For the SM1-2, it was designed to target the CTLD7. We see great binding there. Some binding, nonspecific binding to TSR1 but we see low binding to these other regions. So there's some degree of selectivity there, which is great. Now, therapeutically, it might not be a problem to have one that binds to both CTLD7 and domain one of THSD7A because both of those are epitope sites. So using it as a bio tool as well, these are great options for us to think about how could we study the structure and compare that to the function by using these bio tools that we have with these synthetic binding proteins to inhibit binding interactions, potentially in vivo or in, or in vitro. So, I always like to go back through and see what else is there, right? And so we found a lot of surprises from the model when we were doing this. And some of the surprises were that one, we had that ABAB repeating pattern. We're like, how did that happen? What was going on there? And what we found was that we had a cysteine switch. So here we see the original TSR domain that was crystallized, which helped to define this fold. And we see in blue here a cysteine, we call this the late cysteine. And here we also see another late cysteine. So it comes into this rippled sand, we see a late cysteine. Well, between the individual AB domains, what we see is we have that late cysteine, but then we have it switched to an early cysteine. So it switches up a little bit further. And this is what allows to have that AB-AB repeating pattern. So we see that it expresses it in a different one, different way. So one of the challenges that was interesting that we found was that the TSP1 domains, they had these insertions in the, in the fold. And it was difficult to model those because the insertions, the bioinformatics didn't really like it. And then it was like, well, how, we know that that's not really part of the canonical fold. So how do we uh, account for that? 
So what do we mean? With these insertions, we found that in the AB loop or in the BC loop, we see these sequence of residues that would jut out from the end. So here in pink, what you're looking at is an insertion that we decide this is an insertion in the canonical fold. It's clearly not part of the TSR. And we kind of corroborated that with conservation analysis. So we looked at how conserved are the rest of the residues? And what we would find was spot on is that those insertion regions were not, were not highly conserved. And so that gave us more confidence that again, yes, this is something that actually juts out from the end because it's not part of the highly conserved residues that are demonstrated in magenta, uh, magenta and pink. So then, we looked at the f spondin domains, which would be the group twos. In these domains, what we found that they were pretty highly conserved. There were no insertions at all in these. And so especially in this domain 15, absolutely conserved. What we did also find was that they had a, the, the ladder, which was just similar the same way. All the ladders were the same, the tryptophan ladders, and no insertions. And so that was also interesting to us. So we have a highly conserved domain followed by a domain that has some insertion that's quite variable. So. In the Uniprot, what we did was we were able to submit some of these. We found that there needed to be some updates uh, in, in correcting some of those. And so we, the THSC7A, and then in, in the process of this, we found SCO spondin, which also needed an update. And so we submitted those and got those uh, accepted. THSC7B is the one we're about to uh, submit uh, in a couple of uh, weeks here because we've redone that one. So what else did we find? Okay. The tryptophan ladder has a conserved sequence, which is WSX, WSX, or might now be called WXXW. In our F spondin domains, which were highly conserved, we see that pattern. We do see some phenylalanines in there every now and then, but it's the same compact pattern. It's the WSX, WSX, traditional ladder. In the TSP1 domains that had the insertion, we see the, in, the insert of two additional amino acids in between the WSX. And so what we saw was we had a W and then four amino acids of any kind, and then another W, another tryptophan. We also found that there was a tyrosine that in some cases was helping to participate in this ladder. And so we had a tyrosine and an additional amino acid and then the WXXXXW. And so we still were able to form the same tryptophan ladder. The spacing is a little bit different, but it still forms the ladder. And that was interesting to us. And so it was a novel consensus pattern for a tryptophan ladder. So we decided, well, what, what does that mean, right? The ladder is changing. That must mean that binding partners are changing. And so we looked at all of the proteins in the human genome that have known TSR domains, and we characterized all the ladders. So well, what do they look like? And found that they are family specific. So the WSX, WS ladders are all in these particular families. They only have that. We found another type of ladder that are only pre present in the CCN family. And then in these particular families, they have multiple types of ladders, but all in the same order. So if it starts with A and then goes to a B and then an A ladder, we still see that same pattern in every member or isoform of that protein. It has the A and then the B and then the same form. And so that is important because that has to be some sort of conservation of function. So that was exciting. And so we said, well, let's, let's see how many of them are there. So we counted them, found that there's 153, what we call the standard ladder, but then that the WXXXW ladder, there's 129. And so it's the second most common ladder that we were able to find. And so that was also very interesting. So we're now going in the work of trying to define why we see this ladder, what does it change? And then we found an undefined ladder, which seems to be a combination of the two. So last thing we did was we looked at these and we said, okay, we have these TSR domains. Let's go through. We wanted to model all of them. And so we had the students, they modeled all of the TSR domains that were reported in the Unipart database and any that we thought were there, but not reported. And what we found was a number of things. We found some that had missing ladders. This was really exciting for us because domain eight of THSD7A doesn't have a tryptophan ladder. And so that's one of the ones that right now we're still trying to argue for is in fact, a tryptoph is in fact a TSR domain. We also found a lot of misclassifications where things that are reported to be TSR domains clearly do not model as a TSR. They don't have the same sequence alignment and they're just not quite TSRs. And then last, we found some misalignment. So it's always interesting to find where does the end of these domains begin? Where do they start? And so we found these misalignments and we're getting ready to report all those. But this 
made us ask the question, what is a TSR domain? What exactly is it and how do we define it? Is it the tryptophan ladder that is the characteristic part of the canonical fold? Is it there are multiple versions of this ladder? Or is it the cysteines that actually are holding this structure together? And so we're now exploring those options uh, as we continue this work. So th with this work, we've done some bio tools looking for PLA2R and THSD7A. We're now looking at how do we determine what's most important? Is it the variable domains? Are they eliciting specific binding partners or is it the conserved regions? Do we, what does this novel consensus sequence do and change in which parameters are binding? And then what we're looking at is we're gonna redefine, revise and reclassify that TSR domain. So that's for that structural biology project. Now I'll move to the antiviral work where we started with COVID-19. And we are all very familiar with COVID-19 right now as COVID has uh, kind of upended the world in 2020 for sure. And this is how it works. We know that it invades the cell and there's a few ways that we see uh, it works. So we have the spike protein that is on the nucleocapsid. So it binds to the angiotensin II receptor. There's the main protease or the M-pro, which helps to process the polyproteins in there. And that allows it to prepare for replication. The spike protein targets the angiotensin II receptor, or ACE2, and then we see the HR1 domain here shown in yellow and the, uh, in, in blue, and the HR2 domain in yellow. They fold together to form a hairpin formation that brings the viral capsid down to the surface, allowing the nucleic acid to enter into the cell. So for potential therapeutic options, we could target all three of those regions. We could prevent the MPRO from working, we could inhibit the binding of HR1 to HR2, and we could inhibit the spike protein from binding to the angiotensin II receptor. So what I'm going to focus on in this talk is the top one is inhibiting the MPRO. Uh, this was a project that was born in the middle of the pandemic when we all the colleges said, we've got to send all the students home. And so I was teaching foundations of chemistry lab at the time, and we were in a wet lab and we we're like, all right, how do we actually have continued to have class? We're seven weeks into the semester. Now we've got to have something else to do. And I didn't really want to watch videos of titration because I didn't find that interesting. I also didn't think that watching videos of titration was a good use of our time because you still wouldn't be able to titrate even if you did. You have to actually touch that instrument. So I proposed the idea to the students, why don't we design drugs for coronavirus? And they said, okay, we'll do that. And so this was fun. So we got them to design drugs for coronavirus. And fortunately, I had already introduced a computational lab. So they had some exposure to using Chimera, which is part of the, us doing this. So to do this, we did a couple of things. First, I had to do a crash course on what is a protein. Foundations of Chemistry Lab is our freshman, sophomore level lab class. So it's an introductory chemistry. So I had primarily freshmen doing this work and a few sophomores. So we went to the protein PDB 101 and we I had them watch the video of what is a protein and what is an enzyme and how does it function. So we started there. So we could start to actually look at this is a biomolecule, right? And this biomolecule is made up of these amino acids and try to help them understand that. And so then we started looking at day by day. And this was very fun because day by day, new structures are coming out at the protein database. And I was like, look, we got a new one, right? <laughs> Let's look at this one. And so we put, put two uh, structures out and a 6LUZ and then another one. And we looked at multiple ones and said, here is the, what the structure looks like. These are the surface pockets. This is what they are. And we found that there are multiple conformations and that's an, always an important piece when we consider molecular docking because different conformations might have different side chains that move in a different way. And so we looked at uh, the surface of one conformation and found that there's an actual uh, cleft that opens up, which is not exposed in another conformation. And that was an important piece for some of the work that they did. And so what we wanted to do is we said, this is a good target, let's start working at it. So can we develop some guidelines? Because I like to develop the guidelines and we employ them to figure out how we can design better drugs. So the students, okay, there we go. So we, we looked at the active site properties. So here are the pockets, the S1, S1 prime, S2, and S4. And there in here is the N3 peptide inhibitor. We looked at the conservation. We said, if we want something that binds to all the coronaviruses, do we want to bind to the ones that are conserved residues? Do we want to bind to ones that are variable? And so clearly we want to bind to conserved residues. We helped them understand electrostatics. So negatively charged reasons, positively charged reasons, hydrophobicity, things that love water versus not. So blue being my water 
loving areas, brown being my water hating areas. And so in this case, they learned some of these chemical properties and they started to use them to design. So I just kind of show you the student process of what they did. They drew the structures out in, in PubChem three uh, PubChem online. And then from there, I taught them how to convert them to 3 3D. And so I actually got some got three TAs that said, I need you all to compile these files and make these things like usable. So, so they did that. We learned about hybridization, brought in via CPR, which we had already talked about, isomers and stereochemistry. We created charges, minimized the compounds. And then from there, the we did the docking. And so here, this is one of the students. This is like a screenshot on my phone as we were doing Zoom classes. Like, I'm going to take a picture. <laughs> They're like, yes, you can use that. And I, one of the reasons I was uh, so excited to actually explore this project was because this student in particular, after doing the first computational lab, came in asking all these questions and said, can you design a drug with this program? Can you do this? And I said, well, this kid is a scientist and doesn't know it yet. And so I need to integrate a research project into this class. And so it was a great way to allow the students to be able to explore that. And then at the end of the class, I said, if you'd like to continue to all the students from the summer, you feel free to join my lab. And he followed the path. And so now Ben has been in my lab and has published with us and has done some cool things. So halogens, this is some of the students finding, all these compounds were developed by the students. So I gave them some template compounds that we found from coronavirus receptors and pulled out. Here's what people had docked in them or had crystallized in them. So T47, T1J, and I said, make modifications. Let's just kind of strategically think. Right. And so they decided, well, what, what, what will halogens do? So they changed. Uh, can I change it from a chlorine to a fluorine to a bromine to an iodine? What if I put two on there? What if I change this and I add different structures on there? One, two or three. And so we allowed them to explore. I let them have full creative license to do what they wanted to do. Even uh, it, it was very interesting, very interesting. So they found in this one and what you'll see in these tables, bold is always the one that is the base compound. And then everything else is is the uh, compounds that they designed. So in this case, halogens have no impact, really. They don't really do anything. They're not really that great. And so they learned something. They said, well, it doesn't really work that well. So then it was aliphatic ring. So what happens then? This is, uh, they made these modifications to this compound SFY, another compound. And so they decided what happens when I increase or add a substituent around this ring? Okay, right here on this ring. What happens when I move it around the ring from the position here to here to here? What happens when I increase the length from one to two to three methyl roof? So what, what happens? And so what we found was that these larger substituents, there's the SFY that has a docking score of 5.42. What we are looking for is larger numbers. Okay, so a larger the number, the better. One, a difference in one is one order of magnitude in the lab. So difference of three would be the difference between micromolar and millimolar. And so that's really good. So I like to have things that improve by at least three numbers, three values. So here we see SFY 5.42, their best compound 11.02. So significant improvements there. And so some of the reasons why they, they did this, this is the first round where they put just the butyl group or the propyl group or the methyl group on there and the ethyl. And it just increased the hydrophobicity. So, they, so then they said, all right, well, what happens if we do it again? Can we add a second one? And so they did. So they added a second one round two and created these hybrid compounds. And in this case, they decided that they would put two or three on there. And so they did that. And that created the most substantial uh, changes. So here's SFY. Here's the compounds that have the butyls and double butyls or a butyl and a propyl. And that was very interesting. So the hybrids were even better. This was great finding. So students were well, the question is why hybrids are better. When you look at the subsite, the S4 subsite, which is shown here in green, and the S2 subsite in blue, what you see is that there's this methionine 165 and then a methionine 49. The methionine 165 and 49 create a hydrophobic cove. And so that cove allows those very long lipid-like structures to interact well with the hydrophobic interactions. It just creates a pocket that kind of sucks the compound in. And so that was one of the reasons it worked really well. So then I looked at the compounds when I was ready to start publishing. I said, oh, this is great data. We need to publish this. And I looked at this. I said, that's SFY. That is a planar structure. And these are the, what they built was not. I was like, these are not planar structures. When I looked at the compounds they built and I'm looking at the, I said, give me a picture of what you drew on PubChem. And then I want to see the PDB file. And so I looked at both. I said, that should be flat. 
it shouldn't be a cyclohexane ring. And so I went back and, and put in the double bonds because again, this is freshmen, sophomores, they haven't had organic chemistry. And so the one line and two lines don't necessarily mean anything different, which was perfectly fine. So I went back and retested the ones that had all the double bonds and they were worse. So the lowest score for the unsaturated analogs was 7.6. The highest score for the saturated analogs was 7.62. So they didn't even get close. And so this is where I love serendipity. In this case, the students has a serendipitous find in that being able to move around and not have that planar structure was actually quite helpful in increasing the binding affinity. Now we do see that it does improve it and that is because of the positioning of uh, those substituents where we have the butyls and the propyls and it prefers the matter and the para orientation in those, those particular cases. And that's only because of the angle it's able to insert into that S2 subsite. So here, the strong preference, when we look at the S2 subsite, it has an angle and the ortho and the uh, position actually makes a steric clash that will be created. And so the meta position and the pair position allows it to actually be in the right orientation where it can not only interact well, and this is not a hydrogen bond, this just shows you that it can penetrate deeper into the active site. So it's able to penetrate deeper into that subsite. So M49 was another residue that we found to be quite important. When we look at the crystal structure 6LU7, that methionine 49 is linear and stretched out. When we look at methionine 49 and 5R7Z, what we see is that it actually cuts that sub that sub S2 subsite in half. And so if we had not done ensemble docking for this work, we would not have found that the larger compounds would have been able to pen penetrate more deeply into the active site. So they also decided they wanted to explore what happens when I put nitrogens in these rings. And so we have these two compounds here, T47 and SD30, and they decided to start adding a nitrogen heterocycle. They added this nitrogen heterocycle to the end of this. And as they did that, they decided, well, I can move the nitrogen around the ring. What happens there? What if I put two? What if I put three? And so just exploring with different features of these compounds. And what we found was that in general, the nitrogen heterocycles increase the binding affinity. And that was found because position is important though, because we look at this subset, we see some are better, some are worse. What happens is there's a hydrogen bond with the tyrosine at the very end of the S2 subsite that the hydrogen bond would, depending on where that nitrogen is, is in the right angle to form a hydrogen bond. It's not in the right position, it can't make the hydrogen bond. And so it doesn't really increase the binding affinity. And so the students were able to make some really great and fascinating finds as they, they actually put in their student evaluations, which I love. So what they also discovered was hydrogen bond hotspots. So we found in multiple regions that, and this is in multiple regions, that there are particular sites where we can access multiple hydrogen bonds at a time. So subsite two has ty to tyrosine 54. So the mouse isn't working. Subsite two has the tyrosine 54 that we can access three or four hydrogen bonds at once into different areas. Subsite one has a spot we can access up to four hydrogen bonds in one area. And then subsite four as well has that. Uh, there's also subsite two, subsite uh, one prime. Let's get off of that. There we go. Subsite one prime that does that. So we created a summary or a map of those interactions as a toolkit. So on subsite two, what we can have is in pink represents our hydrophobic region, where you pick something in there that's hydrophobic, it likes that. And that's because of that methionine 49. And subsite one prime, here we have a network. If you have something positioned right around here, you can get up to these two hydrogen bonds. And this subsite one, you put something here, we've got hydrogen bonds between all of these residues and side chains. And the same thing for subsite four. There are multiple areas green represents hydrogen bond interactions. The blue represents cation pi interactions that were able to be accessed. And so we created a map that this from the students and this was really great. They were able to kind of see the chemistry happen in real time because every day a new PDB structure would be uploaded and we'd be like, hey, there's another one. What are we gonna do with that? And so this was great. So the next step was, can we use those rules? Do they really work? And so we picked the compound Sinicerin. It was a compound that uh, was uh, used in COVID-1 when the first coronavirus came out, and it was used, it was shown to have some binding, specific, uh, some, some binding ability. So we decided to apply those rules to see if we could make it better. And so we introduced things that could interact with the hydrogen bonding that had the hydrophobic areas, 
And what we found was that by and far, yes, all the rules work. So Sinoceran here is black. It had an original binding source 6.01. With using the rules, we were able to increase that all the way to 10.6. And so that was a strategic find. One of the things that was uh, important is that all of them actually improved, and that was nice. But another thing that was interesting was we were able to predict using um, uh, mole inspiration, the protease bioactivity score. So the more positive, the more likely it is to be a protease inhibitor. And we know we're dealing with MPRO, so it is a protease. Senesarin was not predicted to be a protease inhibitor. But after applying the rules, all of the compounds were now predicted to have some level of protease activity, significantly increasing it with some of them. Now, there doesn't seem to be a correlation yet between, that we have found between which ones improve it more towards protease activity, but it is great to see that by impl implementing the rules, it actually moves the drug compound in the direction we want it to go. So with this, what we wanted to do is kind of see, well, how is it binding? And so we're seeing that interaction here with the tyrosine. We see the hydrophobicity that's next to that methionine 49. We're accessing that pocket here. We're accessing this hydrogen bond hotspot here, a hydrogen bond hotspot here. And in doing so, we are able to just optimize these compounds. And so that was really neat and uh, great for the students to find. So we did do some synthesis. I called a collaborator and said, hey, let's try and make some of these and see what they can do. And the synthesis, we have actually done the synthesis of several of them, and they did prove to actually inhibit the main protease. And so it was great to email the students and be like, you guys did it, like it actually worked. And so now we're working on seeing how far we could apply this to other coronaviruses as well. And so with that, what we have is I'll talk, these are all my collaborators that are all over the place, but I really like to highlight my students. So I've had an army of undergraduate students. I've had 97 research students, 89 of them were undergraduate students, two have been high school, uh, three have been high school students, and I've had uh, multiple co-authors. And so 36, uh, uh, actually about 50 student co-authors actually I've had, and about 36 of those were students of color. About uh, of those, about 20 of them were from underrepresented backgrounds and uh, high school students have also published as well. And so that has been great to see their name on a paper and them having developed pro, pro, uh, drug compounds. We've done this work. We now have I've repeated similar projects in the biochemistry class and advanced biochemistry class and all we have multiple publications come out and three more in work from what the students have been doing uh, with that. So here is my current group of students. These are just some of the ones that are just hanging out. This is not everybody. This is just the ones that showed up on Thursday. <laughs> they were there Thursday. They're having some, some good fun. Um, and so just some of the former students that I've had, and I like to have a diverse lab. I like to have a lot of students in there. I think collaboration is key and teaching them to work that science is a global enterprise and that we have to work across boundaries. Uh, but in addition to that, I like to do a lot of mentoring. And so this is part of the STEM cohort mentoring program. Uh, when they first got the swag packs and, and the shirts and, and decals and all this stuff. And in that particular program, uh, it has right now, there's been 171 students in the program. There are currently 128 on campus because about 40 or so have graduated. Uh, and it's a four year plus mentoring program at Rhodes College that centers black and African American culture. So it's an affinity based program. And it has really changed the dynamic and the trajectory for these students. So uh, prior to the program, they would graduate with STEM degrees at a 74%, about 74%. And so now those that start in STEM, 88% of them finish. The college graduation rate for Rhodes is 80, 82%, but the graduation rate for students in the STEM cohort is 96%. And so I call that a success. Uh, for students, uh, not only finishing, but completing uh, the degree. And it has helped all the STEM departments uh, to be able to retain, but also to really build resilience. This is the first group that graduated. Uh, and so far uh, out of the program, 27 students have been accepted to graduate professional programs, STEM-based programs, 51 total acceptances, 34 doctoral programs, 11 master's programs, six post back programs. And so they're still, they're still coming in for the third cohort, which is this year. We're still getting acceptances by the day. So it, the numbers keep getting updated, but I, this has been a, a great opportunity to be able to help people to thrive because I tell them, I don't want you to survive. I want you to thrive. It's not about just retaining you. It's not about just getting you to persist. It's about resilience and prospering. And so that's what we like to do because I want them to know that they belong in the room. And so with that, I will take your questions and about any of the topics talked about. Thank you, Shanna. So uh, great talk. Let's start with uh, questions in the room, please. 
Greg, let me bring the microphone to you. Thank you very much for the talk, first of all. Um, it's a pleasure um, seeing the two different types of projects you're doing. Um, and, and also from your slide, interesting seeing that you have a Yankee fan in Memphis. Uh, <laughs> yes. The, um, regarding the strategy of covering the epitope, um, do you have any strategy in place of this? if a need ever arises for assaying um, a biological effect, because of course the protein has a natural function. You're covering the epitope, you'll block antibody binding, but you'll also block some normal functions mm -hmm. possibly. Of course, the binding will be reversible. You have an assay in place for it, or maybe sort of a bifunctional molecule that will interact with not only the epitope, but also portions of anti of immunoglobulins mm -hmm. so that the binding will be tighter in the presence of the antibody than when the antibody is not there or you know, something of that effect. Okay, so that's a great question. And so with PLA2R, what we first did was, was like, wait, what if we cover this up and it's a functional piece? The epitope sites in PLA2R are not the functional sites of the protein. And so that was actually a uh, great for that one. Now for THST7A, we are still trying to figure out what the protein does in the first place. And so we don't know if we're gonna be covering up functional sites. And so that is actually an area where we're going to explore by using our mouse models. So there is a mouse model that produces THST7A in the human and it actually can get the nephrotic syndrome. And so the idea is to see what happens when we introduce epitope a or B or, or the, the synthetic binding protein for that particular one, do we stop the nephrotic syndrome, but what also functionally happens as well? And so part of that, uh, we are exploring what we think the function of it is computationally. We've been doing some docking and finding that there are other proteins that like nephrine that are in that area that seem to bind really well to specific sites on THSD7A. And so those are the ones we're expecting to be functional sites and probably laying or organizing the extracellular matrix in that area. And so what we wanna do is the question is how much do we need? How many epitope sites do we need to prevent? Because if it's epitope spreading, then maybe we only need to focus on one and two depending on where that patient is. So we would run or stage them. And so in that area for PLA2R, we don't actually expect to find functional uh, uh, reduction. For THSC7A, we don't know, but we are exploring ideas to find out what barriers we would come across. Now, the idea of having the epitope, uh, the, the synthetic binding protein that targets the epitope also binds tighter in the antibody. We don't have an assay for that, but that's a very interesting idea because another thing we've thought about is thinking of these as like a cube. There are different faces of these synthetic binding proteins. Can we design phase one to target uh, the epitope phase two to target something else, phase three. And so we are, that is another idea where we're actively designing uh, faces that bind different parts. Uh, and so in that case, that might be a great place to think about if we bind this, can we create something that will uh, prevent the antibody from binding, maybe repel it? That was an idea that one of the students came up, okay, if we bind it here, can we put the other side so that the antibody doesn't want it? I said, that's a great idea. Let's explore that, right? Uh, and so we're doing that, but it would be neat to think about what might encourage binding in the presence of the antibody as well. So thank you for that. Thank you. There aren't any questions in the chat right now, so I'll take the chairman's prerogative and ask my own question. So have you addressed the, the, the potential pitfall of the engineered protein that caps the epitope <clears throat> being um, antigenic in its own right? Yes, yeah, so that's one of the reasons we chose the monobodies because they're not shown to be too immunogenic and engenic. And so when we were thinking of this downstream on the patient side, what would be the barriers that we could have in actually translating it? So that was one of the things, there's low immunogenicity to these. We also explore other synthetic binding proteins like nanobodies, which also are shown to have low immunogenicity. And so there are multiple structures and candidates and we're kind of coming up with an army of ones so that we can say, well, if these happen to be more immunogenic than we expected, we have a different batch that we can go with. So yes, we've, we've looked at that and we're kind of anticipating and then kind of strategizing to pick what's gonna be least likely to cause a problem. 
Great. I, um, I'm reminded of the fact that when um, leptin was first engineered for treatment of uh, obesity and subsequently um, other um, uh, fat deposition disorders, a single amino acid change in that, in that protein was enough to have it completely cleared out by the immune system. So uh, I'm glad that you've got multiple candidates because that, that will help, help mitigate yeah. the risk. That and also predicting through epitopia or sure. other sort of yeah so this was would it be all this work was done before epitopia even existed of course it, uh, and and no doubt that experience has uh, contributed to help contribute to the design of the software are there any more questions in the room any questions online at this point nothing online okay so let me um uh let me close this session by uh, giving you some of our swag. Uh, so uh, first I have a, um, a set of playing cards uh, for you. This is the, the game Bound. It was okay. invented it. by our CSB okay. Protein Data Bank and the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. And what it does is to pair protein structures with their small molecule drugs from the, so protein structures from the PDB, with the small molecule drugs from the Cambridge Structural Database. And you're, the, the winner is the student who is the individual who can um, best match those. All right, thank and, you. And then um, we also have, as we do for every speaker, a uh, very handsome PDB nice. RCSB Protein Data Bank Yeti bottle. Uh, that's, a, that's a collector's item, it'll last forever. And uh, there are very few of them in circulation. Thank so you thank very Thank you much. again, great talk. Thank you all. So let me remind the um, uh, IQB graduate students who will be meeting in room uh, 306 uh, to have enjoy further conversation with, uh, with the speaker.